a talk that I went to a little bit earlier today about white people's time. Franz Fanon and Richard Pryor on negation, castration, leveling, and the articulation of whiteness. This is a paper written by Alexander Welcome of LaGuardia Community College. Incredible talk by him. Listen. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for putting this panel together. And all of you, thank you for coming. Um, I want to talk about something that happens rather often to myself as, you know, an African-American male who's an academic. Uh, and I don't think it's unique to me, but this happens all the time. So look. I'm reading Maurice Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception. I'm reading it for one reason. I'm reading it to figure out Merleau-Ponty's definition of time. So eventually I get to it. Merleau-Ponty says, time arises from our relation to things. Within things themselves, the future and the past are in a kind of eternal state of pre-existence and survival. I'm like, cool, that's nice, that's nice. <laughs> I go on, Merleau-Ponty says, time is the affecting of self by self. He says, what exerts the effect is time as a thrust and a passing towards the future. What is affected is time as an unfolded series of presents. The affecting agent and affected recipient are one because the thrust of time is nothing but the transition from one present to another. Once again, I'm cool, you know, I want to go into a future, I want my present to change. Cool. But then, Merleau-Ponty talks about how time is articulated and he says, we are temporal beings because we exercise the power of outrunning, annihilating that which dwells within us and is ourselves. Now, I read that part, and I'm literally like, that is the whitest shit I have ever heard in my life. Now, I say this all the time, but reading that definition of time from Merlin Ponty and putting it in context, Look at how Merleau-Ponty defines the articulation of time, looking at how he draws upon Jean-Paul Sartre's art articulation of time, going back and looking at somebody like Heidegger, thinking about Levinas. I mean, it comes to the argument that I'm about to make to you today. I'm going to talk about Merleau-Ponty, but my argument, supported by Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask, supported by the stand-up comedy of Richard Pryor, is that when we look at these existentialist theories of time, they reflect bad faith, even sorry. These theories of time are about a denial of the truth. Very basically, Fanon says man must be a yes and a no. Now, when he says that, there's this implicit reference to Nietzsche in uh, Beyond Good and Evil when Nietzsche talks about a judgment. When Nietzsche talks about a judgment, he says that a judgment, you either have to say yes or no. But when Fanon is saying man must be a yes and no, and this is at the end of Black Skin, White Mask, that section on uh, Hegel and recognition, what Fanon is saying there and what Fanon has proven throughout the text is that, look, for some of us, we can't afford to say no to everything. There are some things that we have to say yes to. First of all, we have to say yes to our humanity. Second of all, we have to say yes to what Fanon calls brotherhood. We have to say yes to our relationship, our burden and our responsibility to other people. Must there be negation? Yes. But any theory of time predicated upon negation is a denial of humanity. It's a doubt, denial of the truth, hence it's bad faith. Now, if you start at, if you look at the beginning, I did not mean to stop it. Um, if you look at the beginning of Black Skin, White Mass in the introduction, he ends that first, he ends the introduction talking about time. Black Skin, White Mask is a book about time. It's a theory of time. And it talks about how the present, the past, and the future are related. Now, you probably have a couple questions. First of all, what do I mean when I say this is the whitest shit I ever heard? Um, second of all, why do I say it? I mean, I said that because I was thinking about Sartre's definition of annihilation. Now, Sartre says in Being in Nothingness, he says negation is a refusal of existence by means of it, a being or a way of being is posited, then thrown back to nothingness. Negation can annihilate being, cause it suddenly to arise, and then appoint it to be thrown back to non-being. So that definition of annihilation, that's why I'm like, you know what? This is really, really white. Look, if you're some combination of any of these things, if you're a woman, if you're black, if you're queer, 
if you're an immigrant, you know that our society is trying to annihilate you. You are the thing that society is trying to throw back out of existence, into nothingness. So that's why I said, you know what? This theory is rather white. So now that I've called it white and I've used white in a slanderous way, and some of you may not be familiar with black skin, white mask, I really got to explain to you what I mean. So I have a couple clips, one video, one audio. Um, I, I can't even tell you they're going to be funny, but they're supposed to be funny, so you know, take that as you will. When I grew up, uh, I learned about white folks because I used to eat with a white friend of mine, Dickie Lemon, had a white friend. White folks eat quiet. I learned that. No, they do. Pass the potatoes, darling. Thank you, dear. Mother, that smells scrumptious. <laughs> Here you go, young fellow. And how are you doing in those grades, Dickie? Oh, you must keep your marks up, you know. Bye, gummy. Are we having sexual intercourse this evening, darling? <laughs> I was hoping I could insert my penis into your vagina. Well, I can't. What the heck? So, when we're talking about whiteness, when we're talking about whiteness, prior's a good place to start. Now, like I said, I'm really juxtaposing uh, the stand-up comedy of Richard Pryor, not the movies, and Black Skin, White Mask. So, at the beginning of Black Skin, White Mask, Fanon goes on to define what he's talking about when he's talking about whiteness. Look, he's not talking about skin color. When Fanon is talking about white people, he's talking about the intersection of three things. First of all, pink skin. Second of all, whiteness. And third of all, how pink skin and whiteness, when they come together, are treated in a white world. We all know what pink skin is, right? But when we're talking about whiteness, we're talking about this idea of being separate and superior. Whiteness is this idea that I and the group of people that I'm associated with are separate and superior. You don't have to have pink skin to be a proponent of whiteness. But in order to be a white person, you need to have pink skin, you need to be a proponent of whiteness, this idea of separate and superior, and you need to be in a white world. A white world is very simply a world that privileges pink people who engage in whiteness. So when I say that this theory, when I say that Merleau-Ponty's theory of time is a white theory of time, when I say that Merleau-Ponty's theory, existentialist theory of time, is an example of bad faith, I'm saying that Merleau-Ponty's theory of time privileges and supports whiteness. It supports this idea of people being separate and superior, and it supports this world where such things take place. So, we understand we have our definition of whiteness. Now, what I want to unpack for you today is this notion of white people's time. So, as I start my definition, I really want to take it back and I want to ground it in the work of W.E.B. Du Bois. Specifically, I want to ground it in Black Reconstruction. As many of you know, in Black Reconstruction, Du Bois writes it in 1935. There's this chapter in The Soul of Black Folks. The Soul of Black Folks is written in you know, 1903. And it goes from these 20 pages to these 700 pages. The book is awesome. But one of the most popular and useful concepts from Black Reconstruction is this notion of the racial wage. He says, why isn't there unity between blacks and whites in the United States? And the answer is very simple. White people were paid a racial wage. They are, not were, treated slightly better than their black brothers and sisters. Now, were poor, middle class, and even upper class white people treated as well as the white oligarchy? No, they were not. But when they looked at their black brothers and sisters, they had better schools, they had better jobs, and the racial wage isn't only economic. There's a psychological aspect to the racial wage. So white people can look at newspapers, uh, they can look at media, they can look all through culture and see themselves portrayed in a positive way. So when Du Bois talks about the racial wage in 1935, he emphasizes the economic and psychological aspects of the racial wage. But if you go through blacks, I'm sorry, if you go through black reconstruction and you look at it through an existentialist lens, Du Bois also talks about the existential aspect of the racial wage paid to white people. And it is very much a temporal aspect. Look, 
if we're talking about time and we're talking about white people, look, if you're white, your future, you can be really, really optimistic. Think about this. When was the first time in US history when a black person could really think to themselves, you know what? My kid might be president. I mean, the country started in 1776, but I'd argue, mm, if I was being generous, maybe 1980s, maybe 1980s when Jesse Jackson, no, no, 2008. I was gonna be like, maybe like 02 to 10. Yeah, some people are like, never. They're like, yeah, I know Barack got elected, but I'm not telling my kids that they can be a black president, because it's not, it's not. We're talking about the existential aspect of the racial wage page to whites. It's this idea that the meanings of time and the realities of time are much better for them than it is for their black brothers and sisters. So when we're talking about race and we're talking about Du Bois, Du Bois really categorizes race based on this definition of the racial wage. He categorizes it as separation. No video, just audio. Let us give thanks this day of thanksgiving. Oh, sorry. This is Richard Pryor. He has this skit where he basically enacts major events in history. Um, there are two that are coming up. Might be thankful to all thankful. It's good to be thankful about the trolls. Thankful to be thankful. It's good to be thankful this day of thanksgiving. All thankful. You think? Yeah, master. <laughs> Sing the glory of the coming of the Lord. You wanna stop singing them religious fanatic songs? Boy? <laughs> get to work and pick my cotton. <laughs> and then I can watch you home again. Mars is sing the glory of the coming of the Lord. You ain't got to sing no more, brother. We free. Just pick the cotton. <laughs> now, those of you familiar with Richard Pryor, know that he had this really life-changing experience when he visited Africa. And this is what this next clip is from. No, it's just a nice feeling. I know how white people feel in America now. Relaxed. Because <laughs> when I heard the police car, I knew they wasn't coming after me. <laughs> so when we're talking about this idea of the existential nature of the racial wage, that's what we're talking about hearing police cars and being like, you know what, I'm good. He had to go to Africa to find this. So I've given you a little bit of, of prior, and I want to talk to you for a quick minute about why I'm using stand-up comedy. So when we think about, I'm a sociologist by training, um, when we think about sociology and psychology and disciplines like that, the method is very simple. We have people. People create social dynamics these dynamics are recorded in artifacts. Think about interviews or you know, surveys or historical documents. Then some interpreter comes along, do, 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 do. And then the interpreter tells you what's going on. This is what is going on in these historical documents. This is what's going on in these interviews. And I really like stand-up comedy because the dynamic is different. And I'll give you an example. So in the next couple days, uh, me, Devin, Vince, you're going to be busy. Like at some point, we're going to be sitting around having drinks, and we're going to talk about philosophy. And it will not be me telling them what philosophy is. It will not be them telling me what philosophy is. We're going to come together, and we're going to talk about philosophy. And there's going to be some give and take. And at some point, they're going to say something. I'll be like, you know what? That's right. At some point, they're going to say something, and they're going to be like, you know, it's wrong. At some point, I'm going to say something, and we're going to see that same dynamic. This is why I like stand-up comedy, because when you're a comic in that club, if people don't laugh, you know you're doing a bad job. Mm -hmm. I like stand-up comedy because when I play it for you, you don't sit there as some inert audience. You give me feedback. If you smile, if you laugh, you're like, you know what? Those dynamics that Pryor's talking about, I see those in the real world. So that's why I use stand-up comedy. Now, if we're going to talk about whiteness, we need to talk about the fact of whiteness. I mean, one of the things that you see that Fanon has in common with Hegel, has in common with Nietzsche, has in common with Simone de Beauvoir, they all say that you don't want to assume something that you should explain. So they all say that your research should start with a fact. So we need to talk about the fact of whiteness. 
This is a clip. Um, ah. Uh, How white people feel. Um, this is prior talking about 1976 and the bicentennial. Well, celebrating 200 years of white folks kicking ass. You know what? That was the wrong clip. All right, <laughs> this is the right clip. <laughs> We're talking about the fact of whiteness. Ernest T. Quigley Jr., step forward. Inspector of molesting school children. Uh, uh, I can't, would you turn these darn gosh lights off? I mean, really, gentlemen, I have friends on the force and everything. Uh, There's probably one of these colored gentlemen here. I've, I've always helped school children across the streets. I've, I've done my best, and I have tried. I have never molested anyone. All right, step back, just, just a minute. So, we need to start our research off we need to start our investigation off with the fact of whiteness. Look, the fact of whiteness is very simple. When you're a white person, we're talking about pink skin, whiteness being separate and superior in a white world, a world that privileges the intersection of those things, you cannot be guilty. Can a person with pink skin be guilty? Yes. Can a white person be guilty? No. And so we see Fanon addressing this historically in black skin, white mass, when he talks about colonization, when he talks about in the context of 1952, when he's writing this book, when he talks about the Viet Cong, when he talks about the history of slavery, when he talks about in the context of 1952, what's happening in South Africa in terms of minors. Minors, not children, but minors in terms of digging. So we have the fact of whiteness that takes us to our quality of white people. So now our question is very simple. What is white people's time? And how does their lived experience of time allow them to basically have a better future and a better understanding of their existence? So I got clips. Here we have prior talking about, very simply, white people. All right, the clip part is, oh, no, it's not. Boss seem to have it together. No, we never do anything. <laughs> We're just here. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know, man. The only cats I ever got hung up for were the white Protestants. Because I just felt kind of sorry for them. They didn't have no cop out. Because you know, right? everybody got a cop out. You know, I was Jewish. That's why I paid them. <laughs> I was Puerto Rican, man. They picked on me. You know, I was Puerto Rican. I was black, man. They all buried me. But white Protestants, the reason I fell is because I... <laughs> I um... So that sound that you heard in the end was the mind of the white Protestant blowing up. So we see this in Du Bois too. We see it in Ellison, in um, Invisible Man, and of course we see it in Go Tell Them on the Mountain. Um, Whiteness is defined by bright fatalism, by bright fatalism. This idea that there is a present, nothing can be done, but you know what? In the future, in the future, the future will change and the wrongs of the present will be addressed. Now, just hear me out on this. Just, just hear me out on this. Talk about me when I'm not here, talk about me later, whatever. But look, there's something positive to be gleaned from anti-black racial violence by white people. There's something positive to be taken away from that. And it's this, it's very simple. The black body, especially the black male body in the white world is always a threat. And that's the basis of the violence enacted against it. But the question becomes, why is it a threat? So if you look at um, Fanon's discussion of Rare Rabbit, uh, you look at Fanon's discussion of uh, Chester Himes, you look at Fanon's discussion of Richard Wright, it's a threat because the question is, you know what? What would they do to us? What would black people do to white people if the situation was reversed? It's a threat because, you know what? This present that we have is not going to be like this all the time. These inequalities that we see, it's not always going to be like that. There will be change and justice will come. So 
it's best to get them now. So there's this bright fatalism that defines white people's experience of time. Now, the last two clips I'm gonna play. Actually, you know what? Um, I'm gonna skip ahead because I'm taking up a bunch of time. Oh. All right. All right. <coughs> Now, going off of what I just said, there's this fatalism, and this fatalism is, is grounded in the basis of white people's time. And these existentialist theories of time, we're talking about Sartre and Merleau Ponty, Ponty also. This, here, this, here. Uh, this is prior uh, talking about a play that happens in prison. We have a white prison guard. We have uh, white actors and a white director, and they're just going to have a brief discussion. This here, this here actor, fellas, coming out here. Uh, ben Dodds, Ben Dodds, going to come out here and introduce the, the series of one act Cernic play. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy um, <clears throat> uh, our one act sonnet. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the play is about uh, a young southern girl who falls in love with the black. Well, just a minute. Uh, kind of, uh, that's a little too controversial and I don't think uh, we're going to be watching anything like that. Uh, Jed, you can turn the lights back on and we'll uh, load the prisoners up and just uh, we'll take them on back. Uh. Well, it's, it's kind of right. The, the nigger gets killed. <laughs> no, that's different. Huh? This next clip has prior talking about the neighborhood where he grew up. I lived in a neighborhood, a lot of whole houses was in my neighborhood. That was an economy. That's where I first met white people. <laughs> I could have had prejudice too if I hadn't got to meet white people. I could have grown up and be ignorant and prejudiced. Not me, boy. I learned from myself what people were like, because I met some nice white dudes, you know, he used to come down, hello little boy, is your mother home? I like a blowjob. <laughs> now, if you know something about Pryor, you know that that story is probably 100% true. Uh, he did grow up, uh, his mother uh, was a sex worker, his grandmother did run a brothel. So when we're talking about white people's time and we're talking about this racial wage, what Pryor and Fanon both get at is that white people's time is a way to flee guilt and responsibility. Now, when we talk about the guilt, the guilt comes from natural aspects of humanity. Fanon talks about children growing up. He talks about the socialization process, how we get the superego. And he says that when the superego develops, two things that are highly criminalized, one, sexual desires, and two, anarchical impulses. The sex I don't have to explain, but when we're talking about the anarchy, we're talking about this idea that the society in which we live is oppressive and the natural impulse to do something about it. So these two ideas, uh, the sexual impulse, the anarchical impulse, are rejected. They're projected onto blackness. So when we're talking about white people's time, we can talk about this fatalism. There's nothing to be done now. But in the future, things will be better for all. And we can also talk about this projection. When we're talking about projection in white people's time, we're talking about the second characteristic of white people's time that I want to get at. It's this sealed body, this notion of impossibility. Because in a white world filled with black bodies and white bodies, it is impossible for white people to be guilty. Why is it impossible for white people to be guilty? Because guilt, sexual impulses, anarchy become a black thing. Only black bodies in our white world can have the vicious sexuality that the superego restrains or the anarchy that the superego restrains. So white people's time. A flight from our relationship to other people. A flight from our freedom. Bad faith. And this flight is, I'm losing words here, um, 
this flight is articulated by projecting anarchy and sex onto black bodies. Now, I'm sorry, Pryor sums this up, and this will be my last clip and I'll be done, with his statement on black power. No, why be with black power is just a word. I mean, you don't get uptight. Black power is coming. Black power is coming. Black power, coming. Black power. Ah! And everybody, they really get uptight. But the white knight comes sticking people, that's cool. <laughs> anyway, you have nothing to fear from the black man except his thoughts. <laughs> that's, that's enough. <laughs> antithesis of white people's time is imagination. And the antithesis of white people's time reads its zenith when we imagine what it takes for all of us to be free. Thank you. What an absolutely fascinating talk. Again, we're sitting here at the borough of Manhattan Community College known as BMCC, an incredible university where these talks and these theorists will be here until Saturday evening. 